Training Day with Ray would like to thank our lead sponsor, the Law Office of Richard M. Kenny, New York City's battle-tested trial lawyers, the Law Offices of Richard M. Kenny. I've been in the fight game for over 30 years. From small-time arenas to the biggest show in the world, I've trained some of the best MMA fighters in the sport today. And the one thing I've learned is when you enter the octagon, you can't hide who you are. My name is Ray Longo, and this is my show. Hey, get my spot ready. Hey guys, how you doing? This is Training Day with Ray. I have a really interesting and spectacular guest today, Ken Kelsch. Uh, we're going to get to his story. And uh, I think I met Ken on the set of Brooklyn Banker. You were the cinematographer. Yes. And, uh, you know, one of the interesting things I think about that is, you know, that was the first time I was ever even on a set. And, you know, my, you know, just looking around, um, you know, yeah, I'm a little leery of that whole industry. You know, they say one thing, do another thing. But you were the type of guy that I could ID as, you know what, this guy's not a fucking bullshit guy. He's like a stand-up type of guy who looks like you take no shit from anybody. And uh, I don't know if that's accurate, but, I mean, you had something different than I, what I was looking at on that set with most of the guys. You just had a presence about you that, I think, um, you know, dictated who you were. But uh, tell us uh, where you were born and, you know, how you got into cinematography and... How I got it? Well, um, I was born in Brooklyn and, uh, you know, my, uh, my mom was, uh, my mom came over from Scotland. My, you know, my, my grandfather and my grandmother on the Scottish side, they were basically indentured servants. My grandfather worked uh, in Congolian Naram for 25 years in the most mm -hmm. toxic carcinogenic job imaginable, we'll making linoleum. My grandmother uh, scrubbed floors, and you know my, my mom. Uh, my mom met my dad uh, when she was 20 at a USO dance. My old man was in the Pacific. Oh wow! Uh, you know he was uh, he was a swabby, but he was on the USS California, which had been hit by kamikaze pilots at least five times. So, <clears throat> you know, my dad came back. My father had that mindset of all those guys came out of the Pacific, they had seen a lot of crap and they were going to make sure that we were hard asses because they realized that uh, that our future was probably not much different from theirs. Wow, that's interesting. Uh, and how, yeah. how old would your father have been if he was alive today? Well, my dad was, let's see, um, my dad was 42. My dad would have been, uh, you know, in his 90s now. Yeah, because my father was in the Navy. I think he saw a lot of time in the Pacific War. So, tell us a, a little bit about your Vietnam experience, or how, what happened, how, why you enlist, or. Uh, my dad died. I was in seminary for a couple of years, and uh, uh, you know, I was uh, when I was in high school. I was in a minor seminary uh, at uh, St. John's Atonement in uh, Montreux Falls. So it was a Franciscan Friars the Atonement. I was a pretty religious kid, which pretty go much goes hand in hand with a lot of uh, guys in the military down the line. But uh, I, got a, I, I got disillusioned. My dad died the first week I was there. And, wow. uh, and my mom was two weeks pregnant. So oh, it, was a, wow. it was a little difficult, to say the least. But my mom was hard charged. My mom was, my mom was a very tough woman. So I, 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 I got out of seminary. I went, uh, I went to school for six days a week. You know, we, we read, uh, you know, uh, Virgil, uh, you, you know, in, the rich, in Latin. We read the Aeneid. We, you know, I, was going, I, I went to public school. What else is there to do other than, um, um, you know, get in trouble and drink? So I went to college and I got in trouble and I drank. So I, <laughs> uh, I, I was going to be out of there my second semester. I went down to the Marine Corps recruiter and I said, um, Sergeant, I want to be the biggest, baddest, seedless motherfucker you can make me. And, and I'm sure uh, he that's said, standard. no, 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 no. He said, yeah. son, go back to school. Wow, I was going to say, I would figure they gobble you up oh, right, no, right no, at that no, point. No, 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 no. I went across to the, to, to the Army guy. The Army guy said, here, sign in the line. The guy's still laughing, you know, 50 years later. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I signed up for everything, for the whole full boat. And uh, uh, I made a, to make a long story short, uh, you know, it was a couple years enlisted guy. And uh, 
I, I, I got uh, coerced into going to um, Officer Candidate School for Benning School for Boys. So I went back to SF as an officer. And at, at that, you know, when you're a lieutenant in SF, NSF mean uh, special, special forces, forces right? Okay. Yeah, yeah. When, as soon as you hear somebody say, call themselves a Green Beret, you have to be a little bit. That's a code word. I figure, you know. Well, you don't you, like that. The green no, Green Beret's a hat. So um, you had, when I was in group in '66, guys already had five tours. Wow. No one even knew about Vietnam. Wow. Vietnam. What is Vietnam? So um, at that time, we were all dying to get to Vietnam. You know, it was the only war that was happening. So, uh, uh, and you listen to these guys talk. I mean, I, I wanted to prove myself. You know, my old man had gone to Pacific. Those, I would sit and listen to everybody tell war stories about this, that, and the other thing. Except the war stories never really coalesce mm -hmm. with the reality of war. War right. is, is, is not, you know, when these guys are laughing and talk about this, that, and the other thing, that is, you know, the actual, screams, blood, piss, perspiration of the yeah. battlefield, that is totally different from anything that, you know, the average guy can even withstand. Well, I, I would think. So, um, <laughs> I went to, uh, I, I was with uh, uh, SOG, which was known as the Studies and, and Occupation, uh, an observ Studies and Observation Group, because they didn't want to call it the Special Operations. Wow. So we worked directly for the CIA, and we were on the administration of uh, the 5th Special Forces Group. Uh, our um, uh, Colonel Singh Lab, our commanding officer out of Op 35, was uh, at that time a, a Colonel Singh Lab, who became General Singh Lab, uh, who's, um, who I, I, once I asked him, General, what do you think of a uh, of platoon? He said to me, it's amazing how they got every single scumbag in the army in one single platoon. <laughs> I, I still use that review. Oh, this is so. This is a. This is kind of recent. This was, this is, no, this was. Yeah, yeah. This was. I, this was after I, I run into. Oh, you uh, did okay. Him, yeah. I run into him. I mean, and even speaking of that, is there any movies out there no. that depict no, what no, nothing? None. No, you can't. What, not what's, my the, what's, what's the closest? Uh, well, there was is. Was platoon um, close? You know, go tell it to the Spartans. Is you know, my experience is different from most other people. Right. I worked. Uh, we did what they what they called slam operations: right. search, locate, annihilate, monitor. So I worked with. Uh, uh, we we wore sterile equipment. We wore had we carried AKs. We carried RPDs. Uh, we carried uh, uh, anything to confuse the signature. Uh, whatever we would be dropped. We go into we do cross border stuff. Go to Laos, Cambodia. Uh, we'd be along the Ho Chi Minh Trail. Six of us would spot a bunch of troop movement down the trail. Right. Hello, guess what? Uh, nail five, nail seven. This is our code name. Uh, we got a bunch of targets, and they would come in either uh, CBU cluster bomb unit, napalm, wow. up to up to B-52 strikes. We do bomb damage assessments after B-52 strike had been hit. We'd, uh, and we you're would, how old at this time? 19, 20? Oh, no, no, I'm uh, SF. You, you have to have. You, oh, Joe, so you, you had to have a couple. Yeah, years. Yeah, you have a few years, and I was. Uh, I had my twenty. I think I had my twenty second and twenty third birthday. Oh there. wow! And is this an adrenaline rush for you, or you're saying like, what the hell did I get myself into? Oh, your, your SOG had the, uh, CCN had the highest cash ratio of any unit in Vietnam. We had the highest body count. Of that. <coughs> Excuse me, the highest amount of uh, guys killed. Uh, it, it was almost uh, it was almost impossible to be there for a year or two without. Yeah, so I mean, you're a lucky guy, a hundred percent lucky guy. I have to say that uh, you know my skill set was no better than than, than most, and uh, you know uh, I have to feel that I'm blessed by being here, and uh, you know it was uh, you know God was working for me. Uh, to come back, and, and, and uh, it's it's all why it was me. You know, there's sometimes I've struggled with survivor's guilt, but all of it, and that's that's probably uh, the question you have to ask yeah. yourself: Why didn't this guy, who was obviously so much better than me, uh, you know, like Jerry Shriver, who uh, was there for 33 months straight? I mean, he when he was shot coming out, uh, we used to so when we get in a world of shit, they throw uh, uh, 120 foot ropes over the side of the helicopter. Jerk was up through the triple canopy, wow. uh, and uh, you know we're always being shot at. 
So Jer uh, Mad Dog Shriver got shot and on the way down killed killed a machine gunner that had gotten him. So wow. you know the, these were hard charging guys. And and and, you, and just you bring up an interesting thing. So you did have like a survivor's guilt. I mean, I guess mentally it's a. Uh, I mean. Nobody was addressing PTSD back then, were they? No, it didn't exist. You know, because you know, I mean, I had a, I had an uncle who, you know, he didn't say a word, and they, they said shell shock was what I remember as a kid. He shell shocked from the yeah. war, but he was definitely, you know, they had to take care of him. I mean, he was, he yes, was out. I, so I mean, I don't think, but I don't think there wasn't. My recollection, at least at the time, was there was nothing. Nobody addressing what people were going through. Well, and, they look. I, the first time I went to. Uh, I went into the, I, I was very sick with some sort of high fever. I just gotten, uh, out of, uh, I just got separated as an officer. So you don't get, yeah. you know, you don't get discharged. So I, I, I was at my mom's house and I, I had a 105 degree fever. I go to East Orange VA. I walk in and security guard goes to me, roll up your sleeves. I said, why? He said, well, you Vietnam guys are all junkies. Yeah, so, you know, it's yeah. like, okay, here is a big fuck you you piece of shit behind it. And I walked away. Uh, two, uh, two days later when I was feeling better, I didn't even get a discharge, I swore I'd never go back. Yeah. And I didn't go back for 20, 30 years. So, um, you know, but, but it was a, a, a tough time. You know, the hippies were, in, were just uh, coming in. Uh, you had a, uh, you know, I grew up, the World War II guys, uh, you know, the greatest generation, I don't know what makes us, we'd like the fourth generation <laughs> down, I'm not sure. But, uh, um, what, the, what, what, what destroyed us in Vietnam was the Americom. You know, the, just like you see today, the press, which is normally a bunch of nerdy, uh, pocket protection wearing, cowardly, dope sucking, hippie fucking, uh, you know, guys, they're the ones who decided that you could say no. Right. You know, to tell you the truth, I, one of the reasons I went to Special Forces is I didn't want to be sitting next to some da uh, draft dodging, dope sucking coward right. who was there and didn't want to do what had to be done. I mean, look, I wasn't a hero, right. but I work with heroes. Well, you definitely are a hero. Just I think anybody that <coughs> even listens to services. I think that I, I, I think that that's an over overworked, overused word. I don't know. About However, that. I mean, some of the guys. I mean, that, that was, but you were in a no-win situation back then. No, I mean even dude, I, 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 like even coming home. I mean, you know, you're not well, getting the respect. I mean, respect. I don't think those World hey, War would, those would, World War II veterans got respect when they came home. No, they got laid. I mean, basically yeah, that was yeah, one of the premises yeah. that I was going. I, I thought that I was going to get chicks, yeah. but I'm not chicks. I couldn't get laid in a brothel with twenty dollar bills falling out of now, my. Now why is that? <laughs> because there was well, first of all, I had no hair. Right. I had a you know I was, I, I was high and tight. And, uh, oh, you so know, you're saying because it was the hippie movement, the hippie movement was have... going on. So wait, but hold on, but now you have long hair. Well, I'm was trying that... to make up for lost time. Is that what okay? it is? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> now, well, you're getting laid with the ponytail. You know, I, I, I'm an, you know, I'm an old freak, so yeah. you know, I'm a thousand years old, so it is what it is. But the fact is, when you look at the problems that stem from today, all right, one of the problems is that there's no, there's no martial up swing, there's no martial upbringing. 0.4% of 0.4 of 1% enlist in the service. So how do you, these people have, the average Special Forces guy now has six to eight tours of wow, Iraq and Afghanistan. Wow. You, you want to talk about PTSD? These guys are pretty much fried. If wow. you're in special operations, you are going to do and see things that are you're going to have difficulty processing. And if you come home to a place where you, it's a hostile environment, where do you go? You yeah. can't go to the VA, I, I, you know. But the VA guys, they're they're the, when you were dealing with the VA uh, from the Vietnam generation, we all felt that it was adversarial. All right, so let's. Uh, I'm sure we we can go on about this. I'm fascinated by it. I feel actually stupid because I'm trying to follow all the things you're saying. But so you come out of the, you come out of Vietnam. I come back and I uh, I had uh, I had started at a, uh, I had done uh, a couple. It was like a green belt in, in uh, you know, traditional uh, karate. Right. Who, then, who was your teacher with that? Do you remember? Uh, uh, actually, I was in Anthony Imperiali's school at first, and then what happened is I, uh, in Newark. Right, right. And then... Uh, what style of karate was that? That was Ishan Wu. 
I wish him well, man. That's. Yeah. But then I went to the. Then I went to yeah, Okinawa. No. Right. Yeah. The I think Gary Alexander. Gar was I guy? trained with Gary Alexander. Man, he was a Jersey guy, right? Yes, him and, yeah. and Don Nagel. Yeah, you're going way back. Wow. Uh, yes. I, I, I trained with Gary. Gary was a guy who uh, I was. I did PK for for Gary. Did you really? Yes, I have a, a great picture of me with. Uh, you're talking about the kickboxing. Yes, oh, I had wow. I had a pair of boxing gloves taped onto my feet, boxing gloves in my hand, and. Uh, uh, it, that's that's actually funny. It, it's Who was your funny. favorite PKA fighter? Oh God, probably uh, uh, in those days. The Canadian um, guy Terrio, John Eves Terrio. I mean, he was phenomenal. He was phenomenal. Also, Bill Wallace was. And uh, another you know, Jersey guy was one of my yeah, favorite. Yeah, Bill Wallace was the. Oh no, he was. He, he was uh, Joe Lewis. Yeah. You know, I mean, yeah, was, uh, these guys were. Uh, it's, you know, my problem is that. But a Jersey guy, Paul Vizio, he had a school in. Tom Vizio. But no, there's a Paul Vizio too. He was a little kung fu guy, a Fuju Pai guy, who also did kickboxing. He was phenomenal. He was about 135 pounds. Well, you know, Nagel was was Gary's teacher. Oh wow! And, and Nagel was um, Nagel was a Jersey City narc. And his big trick was he would, from a standing position, kick the rim of a basketball. Oh wow! So he was an amazing guy and. Uh, he actually, the interesting thing about Nagel was he had busted a couple guys and they had come to take their revenge. And um, uh, they drew down on him in his house and, they, and his wife was a, uh, was a black belt too and they dropped a hammer on him but the primer didn't wow. ignite. Wow. So either, I don't know what the, the story was that either she or, I think she kicked the gun out of, uh, out of, um, uh, the hand, and then he killed them both. Wow! So uh, that that was, and, you know, that was when you realized that there was some validity. So uh, I get out of the service. Uh, I do my uh, three months hitchhiking tour of uh, of uh, Europe, trying desperately to grow my hair long. So you know, chicks will not be repulsed by me. <laughs> and uh, I start training at the Amdo, Fred Stahl's place. You go, why? Yeah. You can't keep the crap. You can't kick the crap out of my instructor. So my friend Chad, who's uh, who his uh, teacher, his sensei, was Jim Cheatham. He's a black Muslim guy down in Newark, uh, on Springfield Avenue. So Cheatham killed himself in his first solo plane flight uh, at a Coal Airport. So um, the the school split up. Actually, Alan Lee took over for a while. Uh, uh, one so of the styles I studied yeah, also. Yeah, he was. Oh, so right. He had a. He was a kung fu guy. He, he, was, he yeah. was in Newark too. He was in Newark. Right, uh, right, Chinos, right. And uh, he also had a place in the city, obviously. Yeah, and that's that's when yeah. I realized I was studying with him for a while, and I realized that I'm never going to learn anything from this guy. Yeah. I'm going to be a dojo ballerina. I want to be serious. Yeah. You're a Chinese guy. We're going to take you to the little Kwan in, in Chinatown. Yeah. We'll teach you the serious yeah. shit. But you, white boy, you're not going to learn anything. Wow. Okay, I, can, I, I got Wait, it. Wait, who, right? who are we talking about? Are we talking about Alan Lee? Alan Lee, yeah. I, cause I thought his thing was that he was the first guy to really open up to... Yeah, like, but I, didn't, really. I never... I, it wasn't my opinion. I, okay. I, I, I didn't... I, I didn't I but he had, some, he had some good guys. Cause they, they remember later they on. To, he did, yeah, yeah, he, he, he did he, expand. I knew guys who went to his school later on. Yeah, yeah. Because I remember they... I mean, they fought like the best... At the Waldorf Astoria, they did a thing where they fought like Luis Delgado and some yeah. other guys where yes, he I had guys that yeah. trained for like yeah. three years yeah. that could hold their own. And I, I actually really did like that. So I had a guy who was, uh, one of my instructors was a black belt under Miyazaki back in the 60s and he studied with Alan Lee, but he was, he was phenomenal, man. But I thought, you know, they... See, again, he personally, I thought he was great, but I didn't think that I was getting enough for me, right. I was ang I was like a sponge. I wanted right, to learn, right, right, right. and I wasn't going fast enough. And I think that he had there was a certain period. You know, you couldn't spar for two years. You could only do the three step drills. Right, right, right. Because right. and you, you wanted know, to spar right yes, away. Yes, you know, like. And I'm, um, but you did now. At this point, had you done any kickboxing that you talked about? No, no, I, that was after, this is after this. this. Okay, so this is yeah. still before. Right. Yeah, because it's pretty, uh, pretty new still. Right. All right. Yeah. Um, all right, so you would out only, but uh, so they don't let you spar for two Boom, years. Boom, gone, I'm gone. I, yeah. I, you know, so you wanted the combat yeah, right I, away. I mean, I, after what you've seen, yeah, I, 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 I can't I, I'm serious. I mean, See, it's, it's funny because most guys back then couldn't even differentiate between three-step or one-step sparring, and they wanted to believe that was reality. You know what I'm saying? So I think the fact that you had seen real combat probably 
helped you out with that a lot. But which I'm, I'm surprised you never went into like box, just boxing. I did. I boxed. Oh, you did. I boxed at Chico. I boxed at Chico State. Willie Simmons was my boxing coach. Okay, all right. He was from um, Patterson, New Jersey. He was a welterweight. He was a contender. And uh, you know, I got in a ring. It was the most popular sport at Chico. Yeah. And I was older. I was 27. The other kids yeah, were. Because that's that you're gonna you're getting hit and you can hit somebody. Yeah, you were. Yeah, you can. You you were times. You find I, out. It's a it's a it's a uh, what am I gonna I, say? I, I Character test for the, sure. I, I would go. Well, we would have to. We'd have a fight off on Thursdays. Yeah. So we fight on Thursday to fight on Saturday. So the winner yeah. of your of that yeah. weight group would go. Yeah. And um, it was. You know, there were times, I'll admit, uh, the kid who got me, I went to, to, uh, to Nevada, I went to the, the semifinals at Nevada. Oh, the wow. guy oh who, so you were in there for a while. Uh, the, the guy who... Uh, what weight are we talking? Uh, 193. Oh, wow, so big, that's heavy. Yeah, I was, I was light heavy. Oh, there's some and big we had guy. Artie Perez was our heavyweight guy. Uh, and Believe it or not, 193 back then was heavyweight. <laughs> Remember? It was 175 and over. And so you had guys. Yeah, I think that I maybe that I maybe that was my weight, and maybe I had to come down to one eighty five. Yeah, yeah, maybe. I'm yeah. not quite sure because yeah, I do remember lat running last. Because if you look at it in today's stands, imagine being one hundred and eighty pounds. You're fighting guys 250, 240, oh, yeah, which is absolutely, crazy. Absolutely. But there was some good heavyweights. First of all, you know, I'm like the next last guy. I'm taking fourteen nervous peas before I go out there. Well, you're, you're taking you're, fourteen nervous uh, what? Peas because. Oh yeah, you know, fourteen nervous peas. Yeah, I, I know that I'm getting in front yeah. of you know six thousand of my classmates, yeah, yeah, and I'm yeah. either going to clean somebody's clock or they're going to clean yeah. my clock. That's I a, go that's to a class. now was that adrenaline rush? It, that, it was adrenaline yeah. rush, and uh, but. But do you was, think that the the special forces helped you prepare for that? Well, it gives you the mindset. I mean, it had to be no. I when, mean, when I went when I was training with with Bond and Bondo, my friend Chad and I. When we were there, uh, Mavadi Jemezai used to, uh, who was the leading uh, student from uh, Cheatham, uh, Karim, uh, Bill Franklin, who became Karim Allah, now he's got, still, he's still at Cheatham School down in Springfield Avenue. And did you know uh, Karim Allah? Yeah, sure. Oh, I knew him. Yeah. I, knew, I, I knew him. I never met his son, but I hear his son is great. Little, little and I hear little, little, little K. Yeah, he's all banged up now. Bad. You know, you ask a martial art guy, well, what do you think of firearms? You train fire? Oh, no. What? Yeah. You, excuse yeah, me. See, yeah, here, here's a funny story about that. So one of my first instructor, who I respected a lot, and I give a lot of credit to where I am today, but yeah, he always, and I seen this guy literally dismantle a lot of people. And we'd separate it for a while, and the next time I saw him, he had a gun on him. And I was almost like the same way. Like, you know, I'm a young kid, though. Like, when you're young, you know, you're not thinking like that, but it's like, wait, why would this guy have a gun? I've seen him, you know, but <laughs> for obvious reasons, because the ante keeps up in and you do. Well, it's more than that. I think that if you're. Well, I think you realize that you're mortal. That's the first mortal. thing. You know what I mean? But, it's but not also, like... I'm interested in, I'm interested in everything. I'm yeah. interested in, I'm interested in edge weapons. Yeah. I'm interested in, um, you know, edge weapons, are, to, to shoot someone with a gun. There's uh, one thing. There's, to stab a guy, you know, they but, say but, is but, but, up you know, close and per personal. personal. And, uh, you know, Larry Dring, uh, who uh, was a very famous SF guy, died of wounds that he uh, sustained in Vietnam in, in uh, Lebanon, uh, met his wife in a firefight. Um, Larry always would, uh, Larry would, would take. Yeah, that's that's got to be some couple. He met his wife in a firefight. He got shot, he got in, in oh, the train, wow. he got dragged in, she was a nurse, she patched wow. him up. And uh, they were together until he wow. passed. Wait, speaking of Kali, though, we'll give you a trivia. Leathernecks, what is yeah. that, where'd that come from? You mean uh, the Marines? Marines? Like the Mar yeah. uh, it has to do with something about the back so, of their. See, no, they said what I heard was that they, in the Philippines they would put a piece of leather right. because oh, of the bolo knives. The bolo knives stop okay. them from cutting. Yes, that's probably so true. Thinking of that's probably true. some of those old collie guys, and that's where it came from. But I don't know if it was. Well, you know, the, uh, I, I know Les Ace is the guy who invented the butterfly knife. No, Les is uh, not invented. He just distilled it. Um, I think every kid in the Philippines has a butterfly knife. Exactly. Yeah. Actually, when I was in, in, I did my documentary on um, the Contras in 83 in Nicaragua. I came back to Nicaragua and uh, I had given one of the Guerreros my $250 Lesta Aces, you know, oh, handmade wow. Bali songs to sharpen. They took the bevel and put it over the other side. Yeah. So I went into Burbank and I, I, I walked in. I said, well, Les, boop, 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 boop. He laughed for 20 minutes straight when I told him the story. Oh, man. And then just put a new blade in there for me. But, uh, the, you well, know, I think that's why you escalate, too. I, mean, I, I travel with a knife all the time. 
you know. Yeah, yeah. sure. Well, I, 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 yeah, I think want... the, I think the older you get too, it's like you know what I've been there, done that. I don't want to fight you, so if it's going to go past that, you, you something bad's going to happen. You can call me any name in the book. Right. It doesn't you know, matter. What, what, is, what does that mean? You know, not, I, absolutely you're gonna, nothing. You, yeah, nothing. Hey, uh, you call me but a when you But when you were 20, it meant something. When I, you said something <laughs> to me when I was 20. And See, that's look, the difference. Yeah. Before Bragg, yeah. because there was so much testosterone yeah. going on, You, when we weren't in the field, we were down at the DZ Lounge mixing up with the guys yeah, from 82nd, yeah, yeah. who are the best. You know, these yeah. are our brothers. There's a brother in yeah. ours. But, you know, you are overflowing with testosterone. Yeah, 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 yeah. All right, tell us, uh, tell me how, how you met Abel Farrar and... How I met Abel? And talk about Bad Lieutenant, which was obviously... All right, all right. It's, it's all interrelated. I, I was uh, at NYU, uh, Abel called down, and they said, look, we're doing this film, uh, Drill a Killer, we, who's the best DP? They said, well, Ken Kelsch. So I went, I mo uh, you know, I, I, I met him, we smoked the Joiner Five, and uh, we talked and I was hired. So the next day I began shooting Drill at Keller. Oh wow, okay, now just smoking the joint now, is that a habit you picked up in Vietnam or you were smoking before you went to Vietnam? Did I smoke pot before? No, I smoked a lot of pot in Vietnam, but... But, uh, but did you smoke before? I mean, it was a... Uh, was I it one of those things so. where you came back with that, or...? Uh, I think oh, I think that I may have smoked the pot before, and I'm not quite sure. I'm assuming the weed had to be fantastic over there. Well, you know, compared to, the, what, you know, it was $10, <laughs> the multi yards, you saw the picture, it was legal for them, they couldn't yeah, stop yeah. us, so, uh, and they didn't piss test us, so... Uh, and you're in the highest casualty unit, you're in a unit with the highest casualty well, I would unit, think you're not going to stop. Yeah. I mean, look, I my, would, I would my commanding officer, I saw him smoke, my sergeant major, I saw him smoke. Wow. Um, but it was $10 a key, Central Highlands Red, so it was, uh, wasn't exactly whatever. Yeah. You know, look, I was, uh, I've been sober 27 years now, I don't recommend it, but... Uh, you know, right, for, so, for what it was, it was yeah, what yeah. it was. All right, so you smoked a joint with smoked Abel. Smoked a joint with Abel, we talked, we, we, he hired me, I shot Driller Killer. We smoked a lot of weed on Driller yeah. Killer, thank God. Uh, and um, then we went to my, my wife uh, at the time, uh, who, was the camp, who was the first woman focus puller in the union. She pulled focus on that, and we, there was like a crew of six of us. Oh, wow. And... Uh, we made it for thirty, forty thousand dollars. It's pretty. Uh, I just color corrected it. I just did the, the but, restoration of color correction. But back then, that, that was still some a bit of money. No, what year are we talking about? It's nineteen seventy nine. Uh, I mean, it was. It was pretty. It was nothing. It was still nothing. It was nothing. <laughs> I think they paid me a hundred bucks a day for myself, Dale, our van, a few lights, and Doberman that we kept in the van to keep people out of it. Wow. Uh, and um, so. I went, we saw Apocalypse Now, which stressed me out to the max. Uh, we, my wife had a couple of little fender benders on the way in. I was teaching at the city course. We went to see Abel. We had a, a, a glass or a bottle of Jim Beam. I think it was a bottle. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had a discussion about, he offered me Ms. 45. And he was going to Wait, you offered, what, what are you offering? A movie called Ms. 45. Oh, okay. And I said, well, how much are you going to pay me? He said, I'm going to give you a percent a week. I said, I need cash. Right. Uh, he said, well, why don't I just buy you a fucking Mercedes? <laughs> that what he said? And uh, he was sitting at a table in front of me. Uh, at the time, I, I had a little bit too much uh, adult beverage in me. And I smashed the table with a punch and broke the table. Yeah. And the only good thing is I broke the table. If I didn't break the table, I would have broken in. Yeah, wow. Walked away. We had no conversations for wow. eight and a half years. Wow. So one day, 4 o'clock in the morning, hey, 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 Kenny. Who is this, Abel? Yeah, it's that, that, that. What's, what's up? Um, I just got fired off this film. And I'm making another film. So I went in, we talked. I shot Bay Lieutenant, and th then we made another oh, wow. dozen, 14 films together. And Bay Lieutenant did pretty well, right? That was with Harvey Keitel? Bad Lieutenant was made for only two and a half million dollars because um, it was contracted, we, we, wanted, we wanted to shoot it for an NC-17. At that time, uh, you couldn't even advertise in the movie section that it was NC-17. And the only other art film that was rated X or NC-17 was, uh, was uh, the uh, Fred and June, uh, not Fred and June, Henry and June, 
the uh, uh, Fred Ward picture about uh, Henry Miller. So uh, that did, uh, uh, instead of, we would have gotten three times as much if we would have done it to an R, but it was a great movie. And the interesting thing about it was that Cisco and Ebert saw it and they said that this movie is terrific. And uh, Cisco wrote to every member he knew in the Academy to consider Harvey for the Academy Award, even though the movie wow. was NC 17. So after that, we did um, A Dangerous Game with Madonna. Um, I still think it's 10 times the budget and with Keitel and Madonna. And um, I still think it's, it's the most underrated of all Abel's movies. Uh, we shot that in LA, we shot that at American, at the Coppola's old uh, oh, wow. uh, studio. Madonna was not as bad to work with as I thought. Uh, and, uh, but the, it, it, she did a great job, I thought. But the critics saw her as a shit magnet. She's sort of like the, uh, uh, you know, they they just didn't get it. Uh, Russo was terrific in it. I, I I think it's a really good movie. And a lot of directors, commercial directors I worked with later on, said they saw the movie, they loved it, and had seen it a no, number of times. No, I'm gonna I gotta go back and rewind. I gotta watch that. Yeah. I, I it's think called it, it's Dangerous a, Game. Dangerous Game. And uh, that was uh, the, the funeral was probably our biggest success, but uh, uh, aesthetically, I thought that uh, Abel uh, held it together, walking was great, we told a great story, uh, and I think the last one, which was Welcome to New York with Charles Depardieu, uh, I think that that's really one of his best films oh, in 20 yeah. years, and uh, again, we got in trouble with the producer, uh, Abel wanted to hold on to the final cut, uh, they sold an illegal version with 17 minutes cut out to Showtime IFC. Uh, we didn't get the, the, the print and advertising that we should have, but it is what it is. You know, it's, uh, you, yeah. as the producer said, you want to hold on to your, your old uh, antique conceit, which was Final Cut. And he did. Ken, thank you very much. My Again, I think you have stories for days. I'd love to hear them, hear more someday. I mean, the top, but I think there's more people out there that are fascinated by what you have to say than you probably even realize. But, you know, those old Vietnam stories and Special Forces stuff is... Well, you can, um, if you want, if you go to Amazon.com, there is uh, The Warrior Tradition. Okay. Volume 3 is The Green Berets. And, uh, and I expound upon... Uh, uh, ex expand and expound upon what it was like to run operations cross border in Saab. Man, I uh, think that's crazy. So yeah. it's, uh, there's actual footage of me in there. Um, and that's a that's a DVD or that's, that's a, a DVD. Amazon.com. The Warrior Tradition Number Three: The Green Berets. Well, I'm definitely definitely picking that up, and I suggest everybody pick that up. That's well, great. And if you want to get a little preview of it, not the whole tape. If you, if you go to my YouTube ca uh, channel on. Um, uh, Ken Kelsch on YouTube. Okay. There's a little bit of my interview. There's a lot of little uh, five-minute uh, things I did of my movies. Oh, wow, well, nice. A, uh, I, I, I did a, a, there's the Ken Show, uh, which I tried to help people with their DSLR photography. Oh, wow, well, cool. So all nice. that stuff is there. Oh, well, awesome. All right, there you go. There you have it. But again, thank you very much, oh, man. My I mean, I really, um, thanks for taking the time. Oh. Training Day with Ray would like to thank our lead sponsor, the law office of Richard M. Kenny, New York City's toughest personal injury law firm. And guys, let me tell you, man, when injuries strike, you need a great attorney in your corner, and these are the guys you want to call, Richard M. Kenny. And they're going to stick up for your rights, and nobody else will. I mean, you might think you're going to grab just any lawyer, but when you have a personal injury, man, you really have to find the right people. And these guys are the right people. All right, connect with them online at rmkinjurylaw.com. That's rmkinjurylaw.com. New York City's battle-tested trial lawyers, the law offices of Richard M. Kenny.